I was af- actually afraid. And this is where it really kind of like hits my own like American consumerism and materialism. It's like I, I was afraid of how much it would actually cost me. And because it does cost. But then when you look at the bigger picture and realize like what your your sacrifice and compared to the good that you're doing for these kids that actually have not only do they not have anything, but the amount of trauma and hell that they've gone through. My sacrifice is nothing compared to that. So we just went for it. That was Bucky Buckstabber talking about what it took to go all in on a life fighting sex trafficking through fly fishing and farming. A powerful episode today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Did you know you can read the entire transcript from this episode? If you uh, can't listen right now, you can head over to wetflyswing.com slash 226, and uh, there you can actually read and follow along. Uh, Actually, it it does the audio, and you can read along. It's pretty cool. Check it out now at the bottom of uh, that blog post. Bucky Buckstabber, founder of the Fly Fishing Collaborative, is here to walk us through uh, the story of how he found himself in this very unique niche. Bucky got started fishing through his grandfather on the Rogue River and has transferred that into a focus on steelhead, farming, and doing good in the world. So, without further ado, here is Bucky Buckstabber from flyfishingcollaborative.org. How's it going, Bucky? It's going well. How you doing? Good. Good. Yeah. Thanks for taking the time uh, today to put this together. We're uh, we're going to dig into the collaborative Uh Another one of those uh, topics and uh, amazing programs that are out there in the fly fishing space. Um, so we're going to dig into that maybe a little bit on steelhead. But before we get there, can you just talk about how you first got into fly fishing? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I was I was one of those kids that this is the way that I always put it is I was one of those kids that was born with the fishing gene. Yeah. And, you know, I, I spent a lot of time with kids. I've got four kids of my own and it just seems like, you know, one out of 10 kids just for some reason have this, what I call like this fishing gene where they're just really interested in fish and you can take them fishing as, you know, all day long and it can be as boring and as unproductive as, you know, as it gets and they're still into it because they just want that one fish. Yeah. Whereas most kids, you know, they lose attention pretty quickly. But um, I I was interested in fishing from like the earliest I can remember. And I don't remember like my, I, I was um, raised with kind of an absentee dad. So he wasn't around much. And so I didn't have like a dad to take me fishing. Um, but I had an older brother and we lived around water. And we just were always like intrigued with fish more, more me than my brother, but he would always come along yep. and, uh, in our pursuits of trying to figure out how to catch these fish. And, uh, and then, um, life took an interesting curve for us and my mom just really, you know, she was kind of a product of the sixties and, and, and had hit some really hard times uh, and just needed to recoup. And so my brothers and I all went to go live with my grandparents and my grandpa hmm. was the first one to put a fly rod in my hand. So he, he liked to fish, um, you know, infrequently, but, but he knew enough and, and he loved to get out and he was an outdoorsman. He was kind of a Montana bred, you know, outdoorsman. And, uh, and when I was 15, he took me on the back lawn and taught me how to fly cast and then uh, later that summer, he took me to Montana, and that's where I first put it all together mm-hmm. when I was 15 years old in Montana and got to fish with my grandpa, which was really special. And he had this gorgeous, like, eight-foot, four-weight Dickerson taper bamboo fly rod that he used on that trip. And it was a really special rod. And then I didn't even realize that that would be the only time that I would ever fly fish with him because he ended up getting cancer and dying about a year later. But that was really what kind of gave me a taste for fly fishing. 
And I actually still fish that old uh, Dickerson taper today, which is pretty awesome. It's a very special rod in my quiver. Huh. Wow. And, and I'm not familiar with the Dickerson. Is, is that the name of the company that built it? It's the name of the, the rod maker. Oh, Dickerson. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. That's uh, Yeah, in Montana, that definitely resonates with me. I kind of had a similar story as far as I remember my... I think I was about 14, about the same age. I went to Montana with my brothers on this road trip across and... You know, and it was this amazing trip. You know, it was it was my first uh, exploration out of the state. You know what I mean? So I, I hear you. There's something about Montana. You know, it it brings it. Yeah. You know, but uh, but you're in you're in Oregon now, right? Yeah. Now I'm in Oregon now. Um, yes, I've I've been. I'm in, actually in the Portland area. So I grew up in Southern Oregon, uh, in around Medford. Many of you might be familiar with the Rogue River. Yeah. And the Rogue River is really where I cut my teeth. Uh, my grandpa actually lived on the river in the town of Rogue River. And I would, you know, and uh, I would spend a lot of time on the river growing up, which, you know, it's kind of a cool, like, just little food for thought for all the listeners out there is like, l- I don't think my grandpa ever realized the impact that he was having on me just by taking me fishing those few times or that even fly fishing that one time that he did. And little did he know that it would become, you know, years down the road, not just my my vocation, but also a way in which, you know, Hmm. I can pursue some really incredible things to do in the world, which is pretty awesome. Yep. So, yeah, I guess don't underestimate the impact that you can have in just a little time with kids. That is cool. Yeah, I think of that the same thing with my own kids. You know, I think they they love the outdoors. And same for me. I mean, my story, I would not have, you know, even some of the stuff I do, like hunting, I always think of. I would not have, I wouldn't be a hunter right now if it wasn't for my dad. I mean, I just know it. And mm-hmm. But but since I been, since he got me into it, I still hunt. You know, I go deer hunting every year because of that. And, it's, and I'm so happy I do because it, it's kind of that experience. Um, yeah. And you have kids too, right? So, so your four kids, it sounds like maybe none of the, your kids are into fly fishing. Is that, or, or are you still working on them? Yeah, I think it must be like a, I think the gene skips a generation. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so <laughs> so what, what's the ages? What are your ages of your kids? Um, my oldest is actually uh, 20. My only girl, she's in college. And then I've got an 18 year old son, a 12 year old son and a 10 year old son. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's cool. And they all fish with me, um, you know, but they never, but none of them pursue fish like I did when I was a kid. Yeah. So they, they enjoy it and they love getting out in the outdoors and, um, but yeah, and we'll see, I mean, maybe, maybe years down the road, they'll, they'll pick it up and I'll, I'll have a, a, another fishing partner. Exactly. Yeah. You planted the seed, you never know where it's going to go. Well, exactly. you know, we're talking about kids here, so this is probably a good chance to dig in, and we're going to talk about fishing as well. But um, I want to I want to dig into the Fly Fishing Collaborative, you know, right off the bat here because, you know, it, it kind of resonates with me again going back to the kids, and I know you're working around the world and stuff. But I, I think of my girls. I've got a couple of young girls. You know, they're like five and seven, um, and uh, and it's kind of crazy because I think of occasionally we talk about like you hear about these stories of people getting picked up snatched at a you know along highway i5 or you know it's crazy stuff and it just scares the scares the crap out of me but um yeah i mean that's a reality right kids are literally i mean that's one part of this whole thing right kids are getting snatched up and, and taken into the this like underworld yeah i mean it's it's hard for us to even like you know think about it um and it's definitely you know a massive underground industry that thrives in secrecy and um but it's the fastest growing uh crime network in the world wow i mean actually it's the it's it's basically it's it's even like the second fastest crime industry outside of drugs i mean it's absolutely insane so there are literally millions of women and children and and boys that are being abducted and sold and ex- exploited and sold in brothels and prostitution rings all around the world it's gnarly it's gnarly wow. stuff wow it, what out there um you know i mean as far as like you're doing a great thing and we're gonna we're gonna dig into that but i'm just curious like what is you know what is our government doing i mean is there a big if it's that powerful i mean is there a big uh, group is there some groups really going at it Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we most 
our organization, we mostly focus on um, trafficking internationally where there's a lot of poverty and there's, I mean, poverty is a massive kind of um, thread in the whole trafficking industry. It's a major vulnerability that traffickers key in on. Um, but domestic trafficking, yeah, there are uh, so many organizations that are rising up to do, uh, I mean, there's kind of three approaches to trafficking. There's there's prosecution where they're actually going um, after the traffickers. And there's, you know, a whole lot of policy being put in place. There's a whole lot of initiatives with law enforcement to better train and equip law enforcement officers to not look at the trafficking victims as just criminals and prostitutes, but there's so many deeper layers behind why they're doing what they're doing. And so many of them are doing it because they're being controlled right. and manipulated um, by a pimp that is just getting rich off of their, you know, yeah. off their exploitation, uh, exploitation. Wow. Um, so there's, there's even in the last 10 years, there's been so much happening domestically with, you know, creating new policies and educating law enforcement to a better, you know, yep. um, up and tackle this, this major issue. So you know, there's, there's, Obviously, there's prosecution where they're actually going after the traffickers. And then there's protection where they're, you know, finding the victims and, you know, creating, you know, a pathway out to a better life from, you know, for the victims, which is awesome because historically law enforcement has just thrown trafficking victims in jail and called them prostitutes. Huh. And then, you know, as soon as they're released out of jail, they just go back into the same lifestyle. So there's a lot of education that's happening right now within kind of the law enforcement side of things. And then there's um, preventative measures where, you know, they're educating the school systems and really helping to give tools to young children and how to, you know, identify some of those manipulative, you know, manipulative, you know, tendencies and approaches that traffickers, you know, tend to yep. capture their, their victims with. Wow. Well, and you're you're kind of yeah. you're kind of in the line, I guess. What you do, and we'll dig into this here in a second. But you're you're kind of on, I guess. Well, more of the protection or preventative. I would say both protection and preventative. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And um, and so the unique thing here is, you know, I remember when I first heard the Fly Fishing Collaborative a while back, whenever it was. I had, you know, I had no idea what it was about. Right. I was like, Fly Fishing Collaborative. Okay, that sounds cool. You know, not knowing any of this. So so connect us to fly fishing. How how does this yeah. all connect to fly fishing? Absolutely. Yeah, you know, this I get this question a lot because, you know, it's such a interesting pair. Like how in the world are you helping to fight human trafficking through fly fishing? That's just a lot of people scratch their heads at that. That doesn't make sense. Yeah. But, you know, it it really goes back to just a huge awareness that I had in my own life. Um and I guess it's a couple of things. You know, one of them is that we can simply be who we are and do what we love to do. And I think that's really important. But when we do that, not just to benefit ourselves, but to benefit the lives of other people in the world, especially those that need help the most, then I believe that we thrive as the human beings that we're supposed to be. And so, you know, for a long time, I've worked with kids for a long time. And I've got my own kind of, you know, personal trauma from, you know, my childhood, which, you know, wasn't, you know, the most glamorous childhood, to say the least. And I've always, you know, really had a deep burden for kids that are, you know, neglected or abused or traumatized. And so I, you know, have done a lot of work in the foster care system. I used to run camps for abused and neglected foster care, mm. abused, and neglected foster kids around the Portland area here. And that's actually where I learned more about trafficking was working with all those caseworkers. And I would host, you know, 30, 40, 50 kids all from the foster care system, all with, you know, in like, you know, really, really tough backgrounds. And in a lot of the training that I was doing with DHS, you know, I would constantly hear about the vulnerability of foster care kids in the trafficking, in the, you know, getting, yeah. getting tossed into the trafficking world because 90% of trafficking victims in the Portland area domestically here have come out of the foster care system. Oh, so, wow. 
Yeah. And so I really started to become more and more aware of the major issues of child trafficking around the world. But going back to the thought of, okay, so how can we just be who we are and do what we love to do, but do it in a way that doesn't just benefit us, but benefits lives of other people. And I've always been a fly fisherman. And, you know, I grew up loving to fish. And, you know, ever since my grandpa put that fly rod in my hand on his backyard on the Rogue River back in the 90s, I just have always been drawn towards fly fishing. And then it actually became quite a therapy for me personally. Yep. You know, and I'm sure a lot of the listeners can identify with, you know, the river therapy that I'm talking about. Yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Meditation, you know, everything, the, the, all the problems of life kind of like slowly dissolve as you're, you know, focusing on that run and where that fish is going to rise and what it's going to eat or whether that steelhead is going to grab and what, I mean, it's yep. just absolutely, it's just awesome. Yeah. You, you, you get to disappear from all of the stress of the world. It's, That's it's right. just magnificent. That's right. Um, so I started to think like, okay, so fly fishing has been like a personal therapy for me for a long time. And now I'm an adult and I don't, and I, you know, and, and I'm, I'm, you know, I, I feel like I've matured and have healed from a lot of my past trauma. So how can I actually use what I love to do, but do it to benefit the lives of others? to do it, to benefit those that need help. And I'm just kind of scratching my head thinking like, how can I, how can I rally this community together? Because, um, it's an incredible community and there's something really powerful in togetherness when you're doing something as a community with a common interest for the good to do good in the world. There's something really powerful about that. Yeah. And so I, it, you know, it was, it was really a vague vision at first. It's like, hmm. okay, I fly fish and I don't want to just fly fish for myself anymore. It was amazing and important for a period of time to where it just helped me heal. But at a certain point, it started to get a little bit like stale. Yeah. So how can I like fly fish for the benefit of others? And so I'm just like, what can I do? And so I started to take a different approach to fly fishing. And, you know, so I'm a, I'm a steelhead fisherman. And, you know, especially during kind of like summer steelhead season, you have your favorite spots on the river. And you know they're, those holding lies that fish are frequently resting in. And if you can get there, you know, first light, You've got the best shot at catching a fish. That's right. And so, you know, I'd get up at four o'clock in the morning and drive to the river and hike into my favorite run. And historically, if I saw somebody else in that river, I would be so pissed. Yep. I'd be like, oh, he got up before I did <laughs> and he got the run. And I'd, you know, get all angry and mad. And then at a certain point, I just thought, no, I want to do good and I want to ra- I want to, I want to connect more with this community. So you know, I started to intentionally just like give people runs and be like and meet people and and just let go of the, you know, the selfish pursuit of steelhead and just like instead meet other anglers out on the river. And I, you know, I, and I really started to enjoy that. It started to get more life giving for me, hmm. you know. Yeah. So but it just wasn't enough. It's like, okay, I'm meeting awesome people. I started to throw some like parties at my house with a bunch of the fly fishing people that I, you know, was connecting with on the river regularly. And that was awesome. But it's like, we need to do good though. We need to like mobilize this community to make a difference somehow. And my heart always goes towards kids. And then something happened. And then some friends of mine, uh, a good fishing buddy, he and his wife, they learned how to build aquaponics farms. Huh. And I'm sure we're probably going to get into aquaponics yeah. farming. At yeah. least I'll give you kind of the broad strokes of what aquaponics farming is. But it's, you know, they it's basically a really like incredible self-enclosed little ecosystem where you can grow your own fish and your own vegetables and in like in a rich, incredible huh. like um, organic and environmentally safe environment. 
And they had they learned to build these farms so that they could travel and support orphanages around the world. And so they like they went on this like eight month tour to where they were building these farms for orphanages. And then after that tour was complete, they didn't know what they were going to do next. Hmm. And so my wife had the brilliant idea. She said, why don't we raise money to build those farms? Because like these farms can be game changers for communities around the world. And that's when I knew that's what we're supposed to do. We can mobilize the fly fishing community. We can raise money, but not just like in a traditional way that a lot of people raise money, but we can raise money through fly fishing, through something that we love with the people that we connect with. And we can do some major good by funding these farms. And that's how the whole, you know, founding of Fly Fishing Collaborative started. Just with me wanting to do something a little bit more and make a little bit bigger of a difference mm -hmm. with this powerful, you know, this community that can be a powerful force and to do something for kids. Yep. And so we kind of proclaimed our mission and just started the we did, you know, we started to kind of come up with like ideas, like let's just like auction off a couple of like guided fly fishing trips. There was one safe home in Northern Thailand that I was familiar with and they were caring for about 130 kids. And I asked the manager of that safe home, I said, Hey, would you guys be interested in aquaponics farm? And they were just like, absolutely. And so we just started to cast that to the fly fishing community. And I talked to guides about donating trips that we could kind of raffle off or auction off. And it took us about like three or four months and we had raised $10,000. And before I knew it, we we're on a plane to Thailand to go build the next farm. Yeah. And that was in, uh, let's see, that would have been in 2014. Yeah. So that's how it all started. Wow. So that's it. So 2014. And since then, now, uh, I mean, how has it evolved over the last like seven years? Are you, is it just steadily growing? Are you guys do, I mean, what are your goals? Like, how has it been? And then what are your goals the next, say next seven years? Yeah. That, yeah. Great question. So, you know, when we were, it was pretty amazing because like some stories are just meant to be told. Like there's some things that just are so, they're so good. And it's such a good idea and it's such a good vision. You just can't yeah. not keep pursuing. it. And so that's what happened with Fly Fishing Collaborative when, when we kind of had the idea to like mobilize the community and raise money through something that we're passionate about and then go build farms for communities that desperately need help. And there's something really sweet about that because when you're doing something that you love, it's not as exhausting. No. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Justice work is really hard. And justice work can just be like, it can take a toll on you physically, spiritually, emotionally. It can just like take everything out of you. It's hard. But when you're doing something that you really enjoy, like fly fishing, and then you're doing justice work through that, it seems to be a lot more sustainable. Hmm. And so I remember I was in Thailand and we actually had taken, so we had built the farm and we were taking a little trip, um, into the jungle to go fly fish for this, you know, elusive jungle fish called the blue Masir. I mean, I think I, I often go back to that story, not just because pursuing the fish was such a huge, you know, experience for us, but something happened to me like emotionally and mentally and physically and spiritually right. on that particular trip. I remember I was in the jungle and I couldn't even believe what I was doing and where I was at. And that we just built a farm and that our idea was working. And I realized that my entire life, I have put so many self-imposed limitations on myself and what I think is actually possible and what I can accomplish in the world. And I, and I felt like, like I had put such a low ceiling on what I could actually do. And I was just kind of trapped in that low ceiling. And that trip to Thailand helped me break through that ceiling. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. That totally makes sense.
And so I just realized that, oh my gosh, I have been limiting myself so much my whole entire life. And there is, we can be so much more creative and we can, you know, think so much further outside the box and we don't have to, you know, do everything the way that society expects us. So, you know, there's, there's expectations of a person that has my particular background who was, you know, a kid that grew up in trauma that was a dropout in school. And, you know, there's society has expectations of what that, that kid's probably going to be a criminal. That kid's probably just going to, you know, really amount to nothing. And, not only was society putting low expectations on what I could accomplish in life, but I was really putting those same low expectations on what I could accomplish in life. And then this trip helped me bust through those limitations and realized, man, we are comp- we are, we are capable of so much more. Yeah. And so I realized that we've got to keep doing this. We got to keep building these farms because we're on to something that is incredible and life changing, not just life changing for the communities that we're working with, but life changing for me and those involved in realizing that we can just funnel our passions to make a difference in the world. That's a huge concept. Yeah. And so we went back home and we just like were all in. And continued the fundraising efforts and continued just to kind of grow our community base here in the Portland and Northwest and just continue to fundraise. And then we just kept building farms. And so since we started in 2014, we've built 12 farms in 10 different countries. Yeah. Wow. Which is pretty awesome. Wow, that is amazing. What would you tell somebody that's sitting here listening? Because I love, you know, the story. I mean, the passion, it's obviously coming through. You know, somebody's listening to this, um, you know, maybe they're, you know, a little bit older or whatever. They are they're in their middle of their life, you know, and they've got a job that they're doing that maybe isn't their big passion. But, you know, it's supporting the family. They've got some kids. They got a mortgage. They got all this stuff. And they but they want to go all in on this fly fishing thing. You know, maybe they got a side thing or something. You know, what would you tell them? Because that's that's a challenge. Right. For a lot of people, they don't feel like they can just, you know, jump off. Would you have any tips for that person? Yeah, that's a great question because, yeah, we off, obviously, you know, time is a big constraint for many of us. Or, and maybe you could just rephrase it like how, because you were able to do it, and I, and I had imagine you probably had maybe some support from your wife, and there's obviously everybody's always, there's different, right, with whether there's one income or two incomes, things like that. But yeah. I just know I talk to a lot of people. We have tons of companies, both small and big and, you know, and fly fishing is already a tiny niche. You know, there's not a lot of money in it. So people, you know, I've heard a lot of the struggles, like people love it and they want to do it, but you know, their, their thing, it's just not big enough to do, to do it. Yeah. And, and maybe that's yeah. just fly fishing. Maybe the uh, a majority of people just can't do it because there's just not that much money, but you've done it. And like the Mayfly project has done, and there's a few of these I mean, maybe that's the secret is you've got to find more of a connecting to this, uh, this, uh, nonprofit, a profit passion type project, as opposed to just trying to make a buck. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, and I know the, um, the founder and executive director of the Mayfly project, uh, I know he still works full time. Oh, he does. Outside of the Mayfly project. Yep. There you go. Yep. So this is, it's definitely, I mean, yeah. and you know, it's something that he's incredibly passionate about. Um, and I really, you know, I, I've spent some time with him and I'm, and I really respect him and, and, uh, and I know he's, you know, he juggles a lot because, yep. you know, he still has to put food on the table and, and provide for his family and work. What would be your tip for him? Because, or maybe we just talk just generally, I'm just curious how, how you've been able to, to do it because I mean, obviously you go, you fundraise, you get enough money from, you know, guides and people that are donating and then, um, you know, and you're the executive director, right? So you have uh, basically enough to pay a salary. So, yeah. I mean, anything else to be thinking about? Again, I'm just kind of thinking about that person that maybe, and I don't know, maybe it doesn't apply to everyone. Yeah, you know, well, I don't, yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. And I don't know if I have, like, there's, I don't think there is, like, one, like, easy solution to that yeah. question. Um. Because everybody's story and every circumstance is so nuanced and so different. For you, what has been, you know, you, you told that story about going over to Thailand and, and that turning point. I mean, 
for you, yeah. what do you attribute the fact that you've been able to do it? I mean, is, is there a, like one for me, yeah. you know what it was? I'll tell you, I'll tell you this is it definitely demanded a lot of sacrifice for us to step into this organization and do it, you know, in a, a lot of, there was a lot of risk and, you know, there's, if there's, you know, oftentimes if there's no risk, there's no reward. Yep. Right. Yeah. And so I came to a point where, where I realized that, man, like if I really want to do this, then I've got to take the leap and, and my wife and family were completely on board and we were willing to take the risk and, um, and sacrifice some of our own security, some of our own finances, sacrifice our well-being. Because when you look at the big picture, I mean, we've, we already are part of the, you know, the richest 1% in the world. Yeah. We kind of got it made. Right. And if I'm not willing to sacrifice some of my comfort for the good of others, then like, then how much do I really believe in this mission? Right. And so I believed in the mission so much that I was willing, and I'm not trying to like toot my own horn and promote like, you know, my sure. great character, but it's just like, I think you have to want it so bad that you're willing to sacrifice what needs to be sacrificed in order to make it happen because it does take sacrifice. Yeah. And you just can't do something like this without some level of sacrifice. And so that's kind of just have, that has to be expected. Yep. That's, that's me. No, I think that risk factor being comfortable with risk and, and, and failure and all that stuff that goes with it. Right. I mean, that's part of, that's a great, that's probably the, a, a great tip to be thinking about. Yeah. And then, and then it really like, then it like, then I started to look inward. And because I really doubted like whether or not I should actually step into this, especially in a full-time capacity and, and put my family through so much risk. And then I really started the, I had to wrestle with a lot of fear, like overcoming a lot of fear personally. Like there was a couple things that I was afraid of that I had to wrestle with. One of them was, you know, I was afraid of failure. Mm -hmm. Like, I was afraid to step out into this and then and then kind of like not grow the organization and not benefit the kids way we, the way we want to and then have to just kind of like you know tuck my tail and and find another job somewhere and that's that was yeah. a genuine fear it's like I don't want to fail yeah but the you. other fear was like I was af actually afraid and this is where it really kind of like hits my own like American consumerism and materialism. It's like, I, I was afraid of how much it would actually cost me. Yeah. And cause it does cost. But then when you look at the bigger picture and realize like what your, your sacrifice and compared to the good that you're doing for these kids that actually have, not only do they not have anything, but the amount of trauma and hell that they've gone through, my sacrifice is nothing compared to that. No. So we just went for it. That's cool. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, I think, and, and I know we're going off on this, this little, uh, you know, your, your journey and how it's got there, but I think it's powerful because I mean, you know, we could dig into more of what you do with the kids and there's no, I mean, it's probably the most important thing in the world. You know, I, in fact, I heard, I know you were on the ask about fly fishing. I didn't hear that podcast, but I know Roger and Roger mentioned that, you know, when he did that show, he actually got some like hate mail, you know, from people that were like, they couldn't believe he did an episode about this topic. And I was just like, Interesting. yeah. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. This is like, who's against this topic? How could you be against uh, taking away trafficking? And it just turns out that, you know, again, it, I don't know the details, but probably it was mainly because he doesn't do a lot of these types of shows and uh, and he's more mm -hmm. he's more tips and trips. I mean, I occasionally do some of these shows because I feel like, you know, I, it, it's important and we have this 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 platform to get the word out. So, I mean, I, I enjoy doing that. But 
I also think the people listening, like we said, digging into your journey, there's probably lots of other ideas, Mayfly projects, other ideas that are out there that people, if they know how you did it, or, or at least get some ideas that they could start these other amazing projects. Do you see that? I mean, are you seeing more of these uh, coming up or do you see that as one of your goals? It is absolutely one of my goals. And so just the, you know, the fact that, yeah, that's, that's a little discouraging, but it's, it, it was but a couple. It's not, it was only a couple. Yeah. It wasn't like a huge thing, but, it, but it's not surprising. Yeah. I mean, it's not surprising. I mean, that's just, you know, that's, there's, <laughs> you're always going to get those kind of people no matter what you do. Yep. Um, the, you know, uh, but I've, I started the fly fishing collaborative really for two reasons. One is obviously to make an impact and, you know, and to really, you know, there's a lot of different ways I could fundraise. I don't have to fundraise through fly fishing, but I have been so committed to not just making an impact around the world, but to sharing our story to inspire other people in the fly fishing community. Because when I say that we can, funnel our passions to make a difference. And when we do what we love and we simply be who we are, but we do it in a way that doesn't just benefit us, but benefits the lives of other people, then like we, we can thrive so much more as human beings. And so it's not just the fly fishing community that I want to inspire with this simple concept, but it's like other communities, like you don't have to change who you are to make a difference in the world, but you can actually funnel that. And, you know, and then you can like, whether it's like what hunting or golfing or whatever it is you like to do, like, don't just do it for yourself, but rally your community together because there's power in that unified force and go do something awesome. And we have seen people like get inspired and, you know, there's, there's been, um, so there's a teacher down in Southern Oregon that, you know, is, is starting an organization now where he's teaching a lot of his kids in the middle school, how to fly fish. Um, but then they're taking it beyond just fly fishing. And now they're kind of doing some justice stuff around their community, which is really cool. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely been something like I've, I've had a lot of people just kind of like try to move me towards fundraising through other methods, but I've always really been committed to doing it through fly fishing because it's who I am. It's what I love. And I want to inspire other people just to live the same way. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I, I want to I want to touch just, you know, maybe uh, get into a little bit on the fl- fly fishing, just some general stuff. But um, I before we leave, you know, this fly fishing collaborative um you know, we're not going to leave it completely. Obviously, you've done some shows, some podcasts out there. I'll, I'll link out to those where you, you dug into more of details on what it is. But anything you want to give a shout out? I mean, as far as what it is, anything we haven't touched on that's really important that we don't want to miss before we move away? Yeah, just yeah, just real quickly, because, um, you know, and then, yeah, then we'll move on to some fishing talk. But um, the the fly fishing collaborative became such an important mission for us because what we realized was that there are 24.9 it's estimated, you know, it's hard to get an exact number because it's such an underground industry that thrives in secrecy, but it's estimated by UNICEF that there are 24.9 million people around the world being trafficked. And out of those 24.9 million people, 70% are exploited and sold sexually. And out of them, 50% are women and young girls. And most of them are sold around the world simply because of a lack of resource. They don't have enough food. They don't have enough water. They don't have an income. And so we realize that if we can provide for them a sustainable resource, we go, this is where we're going a lot, you know, back into the preventative measure of human yeah. trafficking, the, the preventative method. If we could provide them from a sustainable resource and they can have food on a regular basis and they can have income from selling produce in the marketplace, then we are lessening the likelihood of them, you know, and of them being, you know, preyed on because of their vulnerabilities. And so that's really the, the, the major kind of like, Yep. mission of fly fishing collaborative is just to find those communities that are in high trafficking areas and provide them a sustainable resource and, um, and empower them through that. That's yeah, that's it. I'm glad you touched on that. I think, 
And it's interesting because, you know, one question that probably comes up, I'm sure you've dealt with a lot is obviously building what you build is how can that be a bad thing? That's great. But how do you get into actually, you know, measuring? I'm sure you've tracked, you know, some of the the, the kids and the people along the way. Is there a way you kind of track that and show that to your sponsors of of the impact directly? Yeah, we have farm. So, we, you know, in order for us to build a farm in a community, a lot of them are a lot of them are orphanages or safe homes that are rescuing kids from brothels or even communities like villages. For instance, in two weeks, we're going down to Belize to build a farm for a village of 300 people but we always find somebody in that community whether it's the manager of the safe home or a house parent to manage the farm Mm. and then we spend you know a significant amount of time training that person that leader how to manage the farm effectively you know how to grow and maintain and sell the produce all of that and then we stay in touch with them whether it's whatsapp or facebook or yeah. email or whatever it is um we definitely stay in close contact with all of our farm managers so we we've got to have leaders on the ground that we can stay in touch with gotcha and so yep. and so these typically these safe ha- houses so typically like this police thing you're going to be on there these there's hundreds of kids or whatever that are, that are have been taken out of the trafficking that are in a safe place. Maybe they're under protect or you know witness or whatever it's called, you know, protection. So they're there. How do you know that those kids don't get back into the system or how you know what I mean? How are you? How do you avoid that? Is there are some of those kids getting back into it or, or once they get to this oh, place? Yeah, yeah, I mean, y- yes. Um, you know, we've like I said, we've done a lot of farms and and every circumstance is so different. And there are some kids that have been you know. Res- rescued from the most horrific brothel situations. And there's other kids that are just, you know, um, abandoned kids that are living in extreme poverty yeah. that, you know, is, you know, they're being cared for by an orphanage. And so they're incredibly vulnerable, but they gotcha. haven't been trafficked. Gotcha. Okay. So, a little bit of everything. Um, you know, and it's hard to, it's hard to say like what, what the rate is for each specific home. And once the kids graduate, a lot of these countries, they have to leave the home at 18 years old by law. Oh, wow. And so, you know, many of these homes are doing a lot of vocational training, um, you know, just to provide, you know, empowerment so that they don't, cause they can, you know, the mindset of a trafficking victim is, yeah, they were abused and they were manipulated and, but they also can get rich. I mean, not, you know, relatively speaking, just by selling their body. Um, but it's such a harsh lifestyle. So, you know, I, yeah, I, I don't have an exact answer for you, but we're trying to lessen the likelihood of people returning to that industry as much as possible through education and through vocational training and empowerment. I hear you. No, it makes sense. I think there's some things that you don't have to really track. I mean, the, the conservation stuff and some of the, the restoration work is probably a good example that, you know, if you're, you know, fixing habitat, you, you can't track every single, you know, animal or fish that's benefiting from it. You just know like, Hey, there's, this is doing good. You know what I mean? And, and, yeah. and that's, that's a good thing. So no, I appreciate that. Totally. Um, so yeah, I mean, I wanted to transition just a little bit into, you know, you talked about steelhead and obviously we could talk about probably a number of different species you fish for around the world, but uh, steelhead is always interesting to me because we have a lot of steelheaders listening. I love steelhead and I'm curious about, you know, like that transition. I always love the transition to steelhead fishing. What what was it like for you? Because I, I, was there a time where you, you or did you just turn around and be like, "Wow, I'm I'm actually a steelhead fanatic." How, how did that work for you? You know, so I grew up on the Rogue River, and when I first, um, you know, start. So after that, I had that Montana trip with my grandpa, where he taught me how to fly fish when I was fifteen, and then um, I had already at that point, like, had been just like infatuated with steelhead because of the rogue and how many steelhead are on the rogue river. And so I was already at that time, you know, bait fishing for steelhead. Yeah. And so when I, when I got my first, when I, when I bought my first fly rod, um, it was, you know, I came back to, to Medford and I, and I was, gosh, I was probably, you know, 19, 20 years old and I bought a Reddington, you know, eight weight single hand rod. Mm-hmm. And the first fish that I pursued outside of that Montana trip with my grandpa was steelhead with a fly rod. And so my first experience really of actually fly fishing 
besides that Montana trip was just for steelhead oh, on the road. Okay. And so I would just, you know, I went down to the fly shop and, and bought my rod and then I would just put a couple of nymphs on and I would swing. So I, I started, you know, fishing for steelhead swinging. What about your transition to more into the spay? I'm not sure. Are you spay fishing now? Oh yeah. 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 So, you know, so for a long time I was like just swinging nymphs for steelhead and it was very productive. It's just single hand. I put a, you know, a heavy nymph on and then smaller nymph as a trailer and chuck it across and upstream and let it sink and just swing it. And I would catch a lot of steelhead that way. You still can, you yeah. can just swing nymphs on the rogue and they're, they're, they're really buggy steelhead. You know, they like the buggy looking stuff. Yep. Like stone flies and stuff like that. Exactly. Yep. Um, and then I moved up to Portland when I was, let's see, in my, uh, so I was in my early thirties. I moved up to Portland and, um, had to learn a whole new river system and just kind of had to like get over my grief of not being on the rogue anymore. <laughs> and I saw, and I needed a new pair of waders. And so I saw, I was looking on Craigslist and I saw there was a pair of Sims waders on Craigslist for a pretty reasonable price. And so I contacted the guy selling them and he was a guide and his name was Jeff Hickman. Oh, Hickman. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> He's he's the responsible party for getting me stuck on two-handed rods. Oh, that's awesome. Hickman, that guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> Love it. Yeah, and so uh, Jeff Jeff Hickman, like, he talked to me, and he's like, hey, man, yeah, you, you fly fish? I'm like, yeah, I fly fish all the time, but I got to I gotta learn these rivers up here. And and so he kind of gave me some pointers, and he said, do you, two do you fish a spay rod yet? And I'm like, no, I don't fish a spay, a spay rod. And he's like, I'll sell you a spay rod. I've got, I've got some spay rods. And, and so he sold me like a, you know, 14, 14 foot sage. And, um, and that was my first spay rod. And he says, once you pick this rod up, you're not going to be able to put it down. No. Nope. And he was right. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was the sage VXP. I think that's the rod. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so, yeah, that's, that's what got me started. And then from, from then on I was hooked. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, let's, uh, we got a little rapid fire round. I don't do this all the time, but I think since, you know, we're going to try to wrap it up here. Do you want to just bust through a few little, uh, rapid shots here? Yeah. Yeah. So first, uh, first one is, and this is one that's been on my mind. I love it. And I, <laughs> the, the name is awesome, but Buckstabber. Now tell me that. What, what's the history there? Do, do we have a history of that name? Cause that's a pretty unique last name. Yeah. So, <laughs> It's German, and we don't say it correctly. It's actually Buchstaber. Buchstaber, right. So we're not talking about stabbing a buck deer. No, we're no. But doesn't Buckstaber sound way tougher? Oh, yeah. Buckstaber sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Buckstaber. All right. Yeah. So, so my <laughs> my grandparents, they called they, they said Buckstaber. My dad said Buckstaber, and we've just always said Buckstaber. So. Yeah, it's great. It's great. I love it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so are you still uh, using a pipe out there? You got like a, a old, old smoke smoking pipe, right? Yeah, I love my tobacco pipe. Okay, so you yep. got tobacco. My is, wife. That, is that what's in a little tobacco? Yep, yep. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, is that is that your vice? Is that your main vice these days? Yeah, I would say that's my main vice. My wife hates it. She's a nurse and she's like, you're going to get cancer. But, um, you know, I've, yep. I try to, you know, I try to, you know, manage my my pipe smoking as much as possible but it's just so it's just so soothing yeah you know you're out there and it's contemplative and when you're fishing for winter steelhead in the winter time and you're puffing on your pipe keeping you warm you've got this little hand warmer right there you just hold on to your pipe and it's got this nice hot bowl that you can <laughs> kind of thaw your frozen fingers with it's, it's amazing. awesome you're, you've, you've convinced yourself i love it i love it i uh <laughs> I, I chewed uh, copenhagen for years 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 and i and i quit a number of years ago and yeah man i mean it was tough because it's like tobacco is so it's just nicotine gets you, dude. Yeah, it nicotine gets you. Gets you. It gets you. So now I hear you. Okay. Well, l let's jump into the 222. This is top two tips, top two flies, top two resources. And these are just kind of general things. But so, so summer steelhead, um, you know, you're on your home river. Uh, what are two flies that you're going to put on there? Or say what, just a couple of flies. Oh, just uh, summer steelhead. Gosh, you know, nothing fancy, but honestly, Purple peril. Yep. I mean, purple. I've 
I have had so much success on so many rivers with purple. Purple is my go-to color. Yeah. I don't know why fish just love purple. Yep. Um, yeah, purple peril for sure. And then the traditional green buck skunk. Yep. I mean, those, those, they're tried and true. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they're killer patterns. Okay, and how about now? Think just generally, somebody's out there. Maybe they're they're out there for summer steelhead, and they they haven't been hooking up to any fish. Any tips you would give them? Just some. I don't know if there's like Hickman maybe has some tips, or if you had some over the years that you'd give somebody to help them find a fish. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I always tell people like, so I surf too, and oh, cool. you know, like seventy five percent of surfing is like reading the wave. Yeah. You know, knowing what that wave is going to do and how to place yourself you know, in position so that wave can take you. And I think steelheading is pretty similar where it's like, dude, you, I mean, if fish only exists in like 10% of the river that you're fishing, then 90% of that river has no fish in it. Yep. And so it's all about like learning where those fish, because if you present a fly in front of a steelhead, you know, if it's, if it's a happy fish, it's going to eat. Yeah. But, you know, and, you know, that's why they say just keep casting, just keep casting to the fish of a thousand casts because, you know, there's a lot of river and not a lot of fish. So knowing where those likely holding lies are going to be is going to increase your odds of hookups 10 times. Read the water well. Yep. Yep. That's that's it. And once you find those spots, so if you're, if you know you're on your spot or a spot that you, you've seen a fish hooked or you've hooked one, what, what would you tell that person there? There are, maybe they're fishing your spot where you know of any other tips as far as you actually swing in the, swing in the fly. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, it's hard to say because, you know, conditions dictate us, you know, some different things as far as like, yeah, you know, yeah, right. Do you want your fly sunk because it's cold? Uh, do you want to take shorter steps because the fish are less likely to move? Yep. You know, because because they're, you know, so cold, they're not going to move two or three feet for your fly. They might move like a foot at the most. So I take shorter steps when it's cold. Sure. If you know fish have been caught in certain holding lies, returning fish are typically always going to sit there. Yeah. Do you try to, when you're, when you're in that run, do you walk down and say, okay, you've got this run, it's hundred yards. Do you just key in on those couple of few spots and kind of slowly work through the other area fast and just stay on those, those buckets? Yeah, I tend to do that. I tend to fish the buckets, a, you know, a little more carefully and a little slower for sure. Yeah. 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 Cool. What about, uh, what about, uh, resources? So again, I'm not sure. I mean, obviously you had Hickman there early on, but any like books, magazine videos, any other people out there that are things you'd recommend somebody could learn, get better at, you know, fly is swinging for steelhead. Yeah. Well, you know, I wouldn't underestimate the benefit of just hiring a local guide. Yeah. Be, I mean, they, I mean, just one, just knowing what kind of water they're, they're putting you in, and um they've all got you know their own you know that they they have had time on the water yep and a lot of time on the water and i think just really you know connecting with local guides it's you know it costs a little bit of money but if you really are interested in upping your game in pursuing steelhead then spend time with people that spend a lot of time on the water Perfect. effectively perfect and is that <laughs> have you you know for the most part have you kind of just taught yourself or i mean you you, you sounds like you fish with some pretty good anglers have you is there anything else you've you know read or any other blogs or anything like that where you've dug into steelhead or has it just been self-taught yeah i would say i would say 90 percent of um my steelhead fishing has been picked up from fishing with other people so I, yeah, I tend, so, you know, I'm, I'm definitely much more of a visual learner. And so, you know, fishing with other people and just picking up little, you know, little nuances of how they're casting or how they're presenting the fly. Um, that's just for me personally, that's always been a game changer. Nice. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, one more before we wrap this up here, um, and this is on the music. I always love to hang on for a random question at the end. And, and recently, so so the question is, is, you know, do you have a type of music or a band that you like to listen to? <laughs> 
Uh, well, you know, it's funny. I I like Chris Stapleton. Oh, Chris Stapleton. Is that what is that? Is that country? Yeah, he's like country. Oh yeah. Yeah. You don't know who Chris? He's, he's I've heard now. of him. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not. Yeah. yeah. I'm not up on the the new. <laughs> I'm more like Johnny Cash. I'm more older school stuff. So. Ah, uh, cool. Yeah. 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 Nice. That's cool. No, I'll. Um, I just recently I get on these videos, and recently I had a guest that I asked him that same question. He said the Foo Fighters, right? Or he went to call. He went to high school with uh, David Grohl. And, uh, and, and so we talked Nirvana, Foo Fighters. Anyways, I put a Foo Fighters YouTube video in the show notes, which I'll do here. I'll, I'll find Chris Stapleton, put it in the show notes. And I love it because when the episode comes out, it's like, oh, okay, go listen to some music along with the podcast. But this Foo Fighters thing, I've been addicted to it because I can't remember the name of the song, but it's just this intense song that starts out kind of fast and gets faster. And, and I just love it. It resonates so bad, so, so much with me that, um, you know, anyways, I just think of like, how, yeah. how can I do the same thing with this podcast? How can we elevate this so somebody's going to be just so fired up to re-listen to what we've been talking about here? And, you know, that might be challenging because of, of the topic today. Um, but I'm thinking about that. And before we go, I just wanted to know wetflyswing.com slash music is going to be where I'm going to put all of our guests who uh, make their note. I'm going to have a Spotify channel over there. So we're going to have a mix of all of our guests, uh, people they recommend. We're trying something new here, so we'll, we'll see if that channel, how that goes down the line. But, uh, but uh, Bucky, that's pretty much all I have for you. Anything before we get out of here in the next uh, kind of six months to a year you want to give a highlight that's coming up for you guys? Um, yeah, I, I mean, obviously, we're kind of in farm building season. We just finished our fundraising season. But um, I would say, yeah, just follow our newsletter. Okay different events are always popping up as far as, you know, the way that we fundraise is always very community focused. And so we'll do like, we'll host a fly fishing film tour in a local theater somewhere. And, um, you know, it's always a fun way to bring the community in to help support the mission together. Because my whole intention with FFC is not just to run an organization, but to share an organization with a greater community. So sign up for our newsletter at flyfishingcollaborative.org. And, um, and just kind of like keep your eye and ear open for events happening in your area. Cause we have ambassadors that are always kind of popping up different fun little, you know, events, um, not just fundraisers, but just fun events to connect with the community. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. I'll put a link out to that in the show notes so we can uh, connect that. And yeah, Bucky, Hey, appreciate your time. This has been, uh, you know, a lot of fun and definitely obviously a topic that's very important. So I'll do my best to share the word and, uh, yeah, keep, hopefully keep in touch with you down the line and we can keep uh, getting the word out and finding more people to support what you have going and we'll take it from there. Uh, thanks so much, Dave. So there you go. You want to find all the show notes, all the links and everything else we covered today, head over to wetflyswing.com slash 226. That's two. Two, six. You can check out our local fly shop this month by heading over to wetflyswing.com slash fly shop. This is where you can check out who we're supporting, uh, trying to do a good job here of getting the word out. Uh, and uh, it would be awesome if you could check that out. We will also be doing some giveaways uh, through our local shop. Uh, you can head over to uh, wetflyswing.com slash giveaway to join any of the most active uh, giveaways that's going on that are going on right now. If you can, uh, tune in next week, next Tuesday morning, bright and early, as early as you can get up. Um, we will likely have an episode. And uh, next week, we got Justin Spence, um, who's here to break down West Yellowstone fishing. Justin's out from Big Sky Angler, has been on the podcast in the past. So this is going to be awesome to talk to uh, Justin again and break things down out there. That's pretty much a wrap. That's all I have for you today. I want to thank you for hanging in all the way till the very end here. Um, definitely appreciate your support. Appreciate uh, everything you're doing out there for the podcast and uh, and helping other people get into it, get a few tips. And uh, and I know this one was a little bit different. Obviously, there weren't uh, there you know there weren't a lot of uh, tips in this one, but I think it's important, obviously, to hit on some of these really. Uh, you know, important topics. And this one is not an easy one to uh, talk about, but it is super important. So if you can support uh, Bucky and what he has going, you can check out that link and do whatever you can to help out. That would be super amazing. I appreciate that. And I know Bucky and all the kids and everybody appreciate that as well. 
Okay, let's uh, let's jump into the next one. Maybe you got another one in your queue you can listen to and just uh, grab some tips. So have a good one. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.